Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Scouting for Growth, the podcast where we dissect groundbreaking trends in finance, insurance, and today, healthcare. So I have the privilege of conversing with individuals who aren't just riding the wave of change, but are the change makers themselves. My guest today exemplifies this ethos it's Dr. Andre Bates. She's not just a neuroscientist. She's a visionary at the confluence of healthcare, technology, and entrepreneurship. Dr. Bates founded Ularis, an AI-centric company that serves as a catalyst for innovation and that in healthcare from revolutionizing operations for the top 50 pharmaceutical companies in the world to streamlining the intricacies of clinical trials, AI-driven solutions have had a profound impact on the industry. And if that's not enough, she's also a cornerstone in educational settings like INSEAD, Business School, and Fordham University, shaping the minds that will shape our future in a world seeking both leadership and inspiration. Dr. Bates delivers generously on both fronts. For those in the C-suite, transformation ads or venturing leaders. This conversation promises not just to inform, but to challenge your status quo. We will delve into the pivotal points that drive innovation, the ethical implication of widespread AI adoption, and the tangible ways in which artificial intelligence is reshaping healthcare as we know it. So, Without further ado, let's dive right in with Dr. Andre Bates. Dr. Andre Bates, welcome to Scouting for Growth. Hi, Andre. It's an honor to have you on Scouting for Growth. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's an honor. I mean, we know each other for a very long time. You are one of my best friends, but... Also, I wanted to actually dive into the world of AI from your lens because AI is going crazy right now with generative AI. And I thought you as an expert could actually help us impact what is going on right now. Not only, I guess, in healthcare, because I think your insight can help us see what might happen in other industries. Perhaps we shall see. <laughs> so let's get started with, with you, Dr. Andre Bates. You have decades of experience in healthcare, in pharma. And so for me, it would be great to have a little bit of background on where you come from, what got you into pharma healthcare, and where, the, where were the, the pivotal moments that led you to pioneering AI solutions within the industry you serve today? Sure. So I really started in the clinical side of um, healthcare. Then I did a PhD in neuroscience. And then I knew I didn't want to see patients, although I had, but it was very depressing because I was in neurology. And so it was a very difficult emotionally because the patients were all um, degenerative neurological or stroke or head injury. And it's it's quite emotionally difficult to, to work with patients in that situation for my kind of personality. Uh, then I did a PhD and I really didn't want to be an academic either. And part of the reason was that I really wanted to see an impact in what I was doing. And the challenge with neuroscience research is it takes so long before you actually see a real world impact. And so that was a real driver for me to not do that. And I was always interested in medicine and technology, but I didn't quite know exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And 
I really just landed in the pharmaceutical industry just because I saw a job ad that basically was my qualifications. But I was always very proactive with technology. So um, I was headhunted from London to Tokyo and really started to innovate the company I was working with there. So we did so many world firsts in uh, digital. This was quite a long time ago. And then I was headhunted again and started the first digital department in a medical advertising agency. And then I really wanted to go add on certain things that were innovative at the time, but my company didn't want me to because everything was working really well. So I left and started my first company, which was in digital health in the 90s. And then I started this company in 2003, which was really initially to look at mathematics on commercial activities within pharmaceuticals. But the pivotal moment for AI was really that we, I started looking at statistical models to measure these things and realized very quickly that we needed nonlinear models. And I went back to when I was doing my PhD, you know, we were using machine learning in my lab to validate the models. And so it made me realize uh, we need nonlinear approaches such as machine learning to actually really validate what we're doing here with pharma commercial um, activities. But since then, we've kind of gone throughout the value chain within pharma. So I think it would be helpful for our listener to actually get to really understand from today's age and time, right, where we have generative AI coming into the market, the difference between AI, machine learning, and I guess generative AI is a type of machine learning, but it would be great if you could actually go through some explanations around those different buckets and where they are the most useful within the industry. Well, AI is kind of the broader term. So there's so many different types of techniques that are classified as artificial intelligence. So you've got things like natural language processing, um, machine learning, as you say, and then a whole heap of other ones. But under each one, there's different types. So under machine learning, you've got things like um, support vector machines, artificial neural networks, and so on. And under those, you've got, so artificial neural networks is actually the foundation of generative AI. So under artificial neural networks, you've got deep learning, which was very, very popular, particularly um, in the last 10 years, it's really gained a lot of popularity. But then underneath that, you've really got generative AI, which is a form of deep learning. And generative AI really started around 2014 uh, with uh, Professor Ian Goodfellow, who was a British data scientist. And he created, he was creating a generator. So he had an algorithm to distinguish between real data and fake data. And to make it harder for the algorithm, he generated a generator. He created a generator, which would take elements of the real data and make fake data from that. But of course, if you do that, it's then harder for the algorithm to distinguish between the real and the fake data because all of the elements of the fake data is actually real data. And so that was the, the foundation of this generative AI that we have today. But there's lots of different types of generative AI, uh, recurrent neural networks, et cetera, as well as, of course, um, pre-trained transformer models, which, of course, language, large language models and chat GPT is an example of. So it really started there. And generative AI... The difference really compared with all the other techniques is in the name, generative. So it's actually generating new data from data. So you can have any kind of data as you can with all AI. So it could be text data, it could be code data, it could be audio data, visual data, uh, video data, uh, all sorts of data. And so what it's doing is it's taking elements of that real data and then with a prompt, it's basically looking at that database that it's been trained on of whatever kind of data and it's making new connections and generating something new based on what it's trained on so of course with all ai including generative ai the training data is really really critical and of course we've got lots of challenges with um, large language models and the training data because of you know a lot of the training data wasn't um, owned by the companies that used it to train on. So we've got copyright issues, we've got all sorts of issues. Yeah, I mean, interesting. I know you were mentioning a clear statement, which was 
um, interesting for me from the outset of how AI and generative AI was created, the generated where, where, words where the first models were generated, so therefore was based on fake data. And so mm -hmm. my question to you is, how do we prevent fakeness? Because right now, my recommendation to my industry, which is insurance, is having this human in the loop. But how do we prevent that? It's going to be a challenge that I am assuming there's some startup somewhere working on. I think we are going to use some kind of blockchain or something that will have to validate our image. I mean, there's, I don't know if you've, you've obviously read about the scam that was going on with the, the fake voices, but there's also now um, scam porn where, um, you know, celebrities and people's pictures are being taken off um, social media and other places and being put into pornography. And so it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem in lots of ways. And it's very difficult um, for you to protect your image now with generative AI. So we are going to need, I mean, there's lawsuits, but um, it would be nice not to have them in the first place. So I think we're going to have to get to a point where we have some kind of digital certificate in our voice, in our video, in our images, that authenticates whether it's actually us or not, almost like a digital fingerprint. So I don't know. I haven't actually seen anyone doing that yet, but I'm pretty sure someone will. Have you seen that yet? No, I have not. But I would assume that it's going to come. As you said, I would be surprised um, that startup would not be working on it. But what I've seen is more and more startup going into the sphere of regulated AI or generative AI because of my regulated industry, banking, insurance. So building large language model, which fits within the industry, we are actually fulfilling the needs of. And training those large language models or whatever kind it is on our data or data that we have the legal right to have that has good you know, analysis of the data in terms of making sure it's a, a representative sample, minimizing the bias, because of course with AI, bias can get amplified dramatically. Um, so it's really about making sure that you know where the data comes from, who owns the data, all that whole governance piece, um, and that it's relevant for your industry and that it's you know legal and ethical, et cetera, for you to use. Yeah. You know, I've been doing some work with IBM on the new Watson X. And so I've been looking at AI data and governance. Interestingly enough, what you were actually echoing just now is um, all about where the data comes from. And there is a lot of work to cleanse this data, whether it's internal or which is on the private cloud or public data. And uh, then you can apply internet and sentiment analysis data as well to whatever you are doing. But at the end of the day, quality of data, then you apply these large language model algorithm on them to achieve specific outcomes. And mm -hmm. so it's very important to realize there's a lot of data and there is a lot of modeling required to achieve an outcome. My fortunate experience was to go to Wimbledon and actually understand how uh, some of the model work to give us the information that was on our apps or how the draws were made to actually tell you whether a, um, a tennis player would win or not. Um, but then there's a governance angle of it, uh, meaning being able to make sure that the data was transparent, explainable, responsible, trustworthy, all this stuff that the regulator actually asking for now. Which Absolutely. takes me, actually, uh, Andre, to um, going back to your industry, right? Larry's counts around 50 and more pharmaceutical companies as clients. What are the top three AI applications that you have seen revolutionize your industry or personally through R&D, medical affairs, sales, marketing, all the stuff you have been doing for, I think, 30 years, actually? Not quite 30. But um, yes, it, it, I mean, it depends on the department. There's in pretty much every part of the, every business unit, there's AI that is revolutionizing things. So if we start with R&D, you know, some of the things that are going on now are things like um, using AI to repurpose existing drugs. And this happened with COVID. Um, we had Deergen in South Korea and benevolent AI that were basically looking at what are the FDA approved drugs that exist that are going to have the strongest likelihood of being useful in treating COVID. And one of them came up 
it was dead and came up with a tanazanavir, which is an HIV medication. And uh, benevolent came up with baricitinib, which is um, rheumatoid arthritis. And those drugs turned out in clinical trials to be effective. But I went back and looked at it recently because I gave a talk on that in March 2020. And I went and had a look. And actually, when they looked at the clinical trials, they were both very effective. But there were clinical trials where they were used in combination and they were even more powerful and effective, which was interesting. And then we also have um, lots of AI companies that are really looking at the disease mechanism and the targets and actually using AI to generate what is the right compound to do. And there's quite a few companies in this space, but some of the big pharma companies are working with them to generate new molecules much faster. So I think those are big revolutions in that space. Another one that's interesting because about 30% of drugs um, are licensed in to pharma. So they don't pre-generate all of their own. And the failure rate of those licensed in ones is pretty high. And I have recently come across AI that is basically predicting with very high accuracy whether a drug will be successful or not in the long term. So that's another one that it isn't revolutionizing it yet because not many people have used it, but I think it's set to, res that's another big one. In the clinical trial process, uh, there's so many things going on, but one of the things that we are doing is using generative AI to generate patient data. So that means that we'll speed up the trial process because it means that we can use fake data for the control arm, the placebo arm of a trial so that we don't need to recruit as many patients and that would bring down the cost as well. And they've been very successful, um, the degenerative AI where this has been done. And we do already have a precedent of the FDA approving drugs that have a synthetic data control arm. So that's another big one that will start to change things. Um, and of course, digital twins. Do you know what a digital twin is? With yeah. Yes, you know, that's a new way. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, what could yeah. we use in our industry in finance insurance, but we do use digital twins, you know, a twin of a building. And yeah. then from that twin, we can actually assess risk. So yes, yeah. we do. And that's the same in, in medicine. So we have digital twins, not of humans fully yet, but we've got digital twins of heart, digital twins of pancreas, digital twins of kidneys. So we can assess what's happening in an organ right now with a digital twin. But I would say, and I, it's hard to make predictions, I'd like to say within the next two decades, but maybe I'm being wildly optimistic, um, we eventually will have digital twins of each of us. And that is going to change everything. It's you know like we used to have in the automotive industry where the cars would be actually physically crash tested. That's a bit like our clinical trial system now you know, the humans take the drug and test what happens. Whereas with automotive, it's all modeled mechanically now. When we have full digital twins of humans, we will be able to test the drugs on the digital data and we won't need humans in the trial. And that I think probably will be one of the biggest things because we have, you know, four phases of clinical trials that cost, you know, billions to get us to market. And so when we don't need to do that and we can do it all automated with digital twin data, that's going to change a lot. But in every other area as well, you know, um, I just was talking to someone who automates clinical study reports, and those, you know, take six weeks and a big team. And what they're finding is doing it with AI, there's no errors in the reports. Uh, they still have a human for quality control at the end from the pharma because we're highly regulated, we need to check. But when they look at the, the difference between the errors in the human generated one because humans are error prone um, versus the AI one. There's re marked reduction in errors, but also a clinical study report can take about six weeks for a team to write. It's a big job. And with AI, it can take two weeks to train the model for the beginning. But after that, it can actually write 100% basically complete. They say not 100% because you know, someone has to check it, but it is basically written in 30 minutes. So that's, that's yeah, funny. I mean, that is fascinating what, you know, generative AI can do. Mm -hmm. And I was going to dive into a bit more around the power of AI within, you know, my industry, so insurance, so PNC, think building. So we talked about the digital twins. And yes, we are doing a lot 
around digital twinning. So imagine, you know, Grandfield Tower, we have a digital twin that should not happen ever again. Um, and one of the startup, uh, which is really doing amazing work on this is called artificial uh, AI. And they are able to provide the reporting for buildings and they are able to actually understand, you know, by looking at the positioning of uh, the sprinklers and all the things which affect the building, what risk could actually affect that building and just do audits and reporting. Um, then what excites me super very much actually in that sphere is uh, the data. You know, we are in a sustainability world, so we need to actually understand how weather risk is affecting us. We've seen a lot of wildfires and storms and things still happening as we are speaking uh, right now, uh, Andre. And um, so for us, it's a data. So combining the internal data with the external data, with geospatial data, and I actually understand now you even have geospatial data for people. And then applying the algorithm to actually provide prediction and prevention and mitigation strategies to actually reduce the cost of the risk. Because what you are seeing is saying with the clinical trials is we can actually reduce complexity, we can reduce cost, and we can reduce failure rate. Now, in the life side, which is much more akin to healthcare, longevity mm -hmm. and aging is a big problem. So I was talking just last week with a number of of insurers whilst I was in Switzerland and said, you know, Sabine, we talk about sustainability, wildfire and all things, heat. You know, we have had a lot of heat in recent weeks. Here's the thing, the problem is the body, our body is not built to actually sustain that heat. And think about the elderly, uh, which means that people are dying earlier and actually end up in hospital as well because they cannot deal with the heat affecting them. And so that's where, again, uh, AI, generative AI can be helpful to predict, uh, allocate, uh, direct, um, and potentially use, you know, through sensors and IoT to actually know that things might happen to people as well in their home. What's your view, Andre? It's very interesting because I actually do have a friend in London who is an architect and she is building homes that have generative, well, AI, it's actually machine learning, in the bathroom. So they have AI in the bathroom mirrors. And what it's doing is sensing the person's face and body in the mirror and looking for micro changes day to day that could be indicative of some kind of illness and predict and the toilets do urine and feces analyses as well. So that's all like a smart home on steroids, I guess. But I would say that, and they're not inexpensive homes, but I would say that like all technology, the cost will come down. And I can see that, you know, obviously a lot of things are now in our phone, but I think in our homes as well, we're going to have a lot of AI doing a lot of different things like that, but where it will be predicting our health, giving us, there's a great company, actually, I, I showed a video of them at a conference in 2012. And I think that probably the mechanism that they used may change, but what they do was amazing. So they had these little cubes, and you could put in a little pinprick of blood, or a bit of saliva, whatever it is, it would analyze it, and tell you what was needed. And if you needed a prescription, it would then contact put you in contact with your doctor automatically, get the appointment, do the telemedicine call, and then they would have access, the system has access to your schedule. So it would send the prescription to a pharmacy near where you or someone in your family was going to be, and you would get it home. So I think it's going to become much more of an ecosystem with our health diagnostics that's linked to the home. I have no doubt. And, you know, last week, I was very fortunate to be speaking uh, with a uh, Swiss Re uh, executives and a number of their clients at the Swiss Re Center for Global Dialogue, a beautiful location in Rashlikon. And I came across or I shared a, a scenario of Julia 
who is based on a book I really enjoys reading from Colin Chase called The Economics of Singularity or The Economic Singularity. And uh, it actually goes through exactly the same example you talked about just now, Andre, with the sensors looking at people and looking at micro changes to see whether people are healthy or not. My scenario is those micro uh, items where you know blood streams and so being able to see the changes happening in our body and so becomes really interesting predictors of future underwriting premiums and risk and therefore prevent again and predict what might happen you know we are using nanobots now which are these little um robots that can go into the bloodstream and you know get rid of cholesterol target cancer but I actually know Callum Chase, um, and I had that, we actually discussed that, um, I think about six months ago. Uh, he's got some really interesting um, <laughs> discussion about the economic singularity and how he sees that shaping. I found it really interesting. Absolutely. Great book. And for me, it was um, the angle I wanted also to bring to my industry is that when you look at the industrial revolution mechanism um even looking at the car, you know, think about Ford, you know, humans were building this car, then we went into mechanism and then technology to the job of people, but long-term people just find jobs. They just became re-educated and retrained in new roles. So we are going to go through a period of discomfort, I'm sure, with artificial intelligence, but it's here and it's here to stay. Um, and so we as human need to understand that we are knowledge workers and our brains are here to process information to make it simpler for people to understand. And so the theory around, yes, probably jobs are going to be challenged and maybe we are vocational workers in the future rather than working for big salaries, God knows, was mm -hmm. actually a very interesting thesis in mm -hmm. the book that Colm actually wrote. I really liked how far he takes it because I remember he started with, okay, you know, self-driving cars, that's going to basically get rid of people driving cars. However, he took it further and he said that um, that's also going to impact so many other areas because, you know, we won't, the governments won't be getting the speeding fines from anyone anymore because the self-driving cars will be set to drive at the speed limit. They, there won't be parking fines anywhere because the self-driving cars will know what, what's legal and what's not to park in. Mm -hmm. um, so many things that change the finances of governments from just that one change with vocation. And he brought it into so many different areas in the book, of course, but it just, and your industry insurance, you know, if you just think about car insurance, yes. that majorly impacted if, if the human is not driving the car, then the insurance would, I would assume, have to be with the manufacturer, right? You're absolutely right. And you are not even, you know, a deep dive um, insurance practitioner. But yes, the liability moves. So yeah. from being you and I having insurance on our car, it moved to the manufacturers, it moved to the commercial. And actually mm -hmm. it moves to um, whoever is liable for some of the technologies in that vehicle as well. So it's very different. Us as human, we don't have insurance anymore. It will be those producing those assets, which actually we are sitting in rather than operating that become liable for the risk, 100%. It will change insurance in so many ways, actually. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and the industry is changing completely. You know, yeah. it feels like it's slowly, but um, all these things which I call emerging risk mm -hmm. are actually top of mind for a lot of executive. And it's exciting, I have to say, it's super exciting for me because we are going beyond travel, home car, in commercial lines, we are going beyond liability, people like you and I, you know, or SME properties, you are starting looking at smart properties, you are trying to look at autonomous driving, and you're trying to actually understand what is going to be the impact of technology on our sector our industry, and therefore how the risk is going to change and the liability is going to change. And what that means for the new products, because the new products will require technology for them to operate the data, the IoT, the sensors, 
and then the algorithm to evaluate the risk, and then a lot of additional things to enable um, insurers to be more present within the life of their customers, which require much more streamlined and engagement rate, you know, using digitalization, engagement-driven environment. Andre, I wanted to for you to tell us a little bit more about Alaris and the type of things you are doing with your customers every day to change the way they are looking at their world with artificial intelligence. Sure. I mean, every area that we do is different. So every company has different challenges. Um, So when we started, it was very much in the commercial space. So a lot of sales and marketing to start with. For that, there's so many things that we can do. For example, there's a big push for rare disease these days with pharma. There's about 8,000 rare diseases. Uh, they weren't looked at that much in the early days because they're so rare. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might only have 100 patients in the world with with, a, with an ultra rare disease. Oh. So you know, spending a few billion to get a drug to market and you've only got 100 patients is difficult. But now everyone's doing it. So you know, <laughs> so we're doing it now. But the challenge they have for both clinical trials and sales and marketing is they can't find the patients because they spend so much time and money trying to educate doctors how to find a patient, but 99.99999% of any doctor will never see a patient in their life. So direct to consumer, right? Being able to go direct to your consumer rather than going through the distribution. We are suffering from the same. So I'm listening, Andre. (laughs) So we use uh, big data, um, um, medical record data and so on to really firstly diagnose patients in the first place. You know, we can actually find, diag- once we know the patients who are diagnosed, we can look at them and actually model based on them and search through, you know, trillions of, of cases and say, okay, these patients, they're not diagnosed with it, but we're pretty sure we have a really high probability that these patients have got this condition. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know who they are because, of course, we're highly, highly regulated and data privacy is really important for all of us. So we know who their doctor is. So we can then at least let the doctor know about those targeted doctors who are highly likely to have a patient. They're the ones we need to educate about how to diagnose that patient, how to identify the patient. So we do a lot of that both for um, finding patients for clinical trials, but also for sales and marketing so that the sales reps can go to the right doctors rather than scattergun approach to everyone Mm -hmm. so there's that kind of thing um there is you know 30 yeah about 40 to 60 percent actually of all patients after three months stop taking their drug Uh, there's lots of different reasons that happens and the challenge is that in the u.s alone 125,000 people die because of that every year wow that's huge. A uh, third of all hospital admissions are because of that as well. And if we could just understand and predict and change the behavior before you know they die or need to hospitalization, it makes a huge difference. So we've done projects where we're able to look at all the patients and we know which ones have stopped taking the drug based on they're not filling their prescriptions. And then we can identify in advance These are the patients that are going to be the most at risk for potentially not adhering to the drug. And then from that, um, I can go into a lot more detail another time, but from that we can actually give, in the case that I'm thinking of for one client, there was a nurse educator that would go to the patient's house every week to help them take the drug because it was a needle. So we can give the nurses the heads up that these are the patients that you need to talk to and these are the things that they need to understand because, you know, it's not just... Um, they're forgotten or something like that. There's over 250 reasons. So it's making sure that you've got the right reason for that patient to help them understand why it's really critical. Because a lot of conditions don't have symptoms that, you know, so, you know, the common one, which is, you know, we all can relate to is antibiotics. You know, you take the drugs and you're better and you're like, oh, do I need to finish it off? And so it's, you know, that's a simple example, but in so many drug cases, we have that. And then things like omni-channel next best action, you know, making sure that our marketing is serving up the right content to the right person in the right sequence and the right channel. And you want it to be really valuable content for that person. So you have to look at 
all the different segments of, um, and they could some of them could only be a segment of one, but the segments of different people and how they move through the different um, marketing or channels. Uh, or assets, yeah, yeah, get up. Mm -hmm. And then what's the best flow for the different personality types, different, um, all of the different things that go into their, their, their cluster, their segment. And then that helps you to serve up content that really just looks like, and it's happened to me, uh, you think, ah, that's exactly what I wanted next. That's amazing. Every time that's happened to me, I've gone, ah, of course, they're using AI. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you have a really good experience, it's AI well used. Um, those sort of things we also do um, for market access, you know, value pricing to make sure that it's a bit like the Airbnb, you know, where they've got that pricing out calculator. Um, so we're looking at, you know, what is the right price that's going to get um, the most uptake patients and the most um, reimbursement from the different um, reimbursement authorities. Uh, so many different things, target, precision target, doctor, uh, doctor targeting, uh, lots of things like that. Uh, it's also interesting, right, because you have so many different angles. And as I'm listening to you, Andre, I realize a lot of those scenarios could apply in finance as well. Yeah, I actually gave a talk to deans of business schools in America at the beginning of the year. And I was thinking about giving examples of AI in pharma. And for every example, I thought, wow, you could actually apply that in business schools in this way. Totally different use case, but actually the same underlying thing can work yeah. in different ways. And I was amazed actually how many parallels there were with business schools and pharmaceuticals. So yeah, there's so many. And even things like in medical affairs, you know, literature monitoring, if you think about mm -hmm. oncology, there's like 5,000 new articles every week. And in the old days, you know, the medical affairs team were just trawling through all these journals, reading them all each week and trying to process them, which is almost impossible. And so now we've got AI that basically does all of that hard work for them, summarizes the key things they need to know, what's going to be an impact for them, et cetera. So, you know, it just saves a lot more time and the humans can focus on more the high value kind of work that they need to do. Yeah, it is about human in the loop and focusing on high value activity. So I wanted to ask you, you are an advocate for empowering uh, female entrepreneurs and helping them actually build better lives for themselves. How can women in healthcare tech leverage artificial intelligence to break the grass ceiling? And I know you have a course that is super useful for women wanting to come out of industry to actually understand how AI works and how to leverage it for their growth, personal growth as well. Tell us more. <laughs> well, actually, um, there's lots of really interesting AI, but yes, I actually announced today with, with Medicare's AI, which um, brings together academics in AI and healthcare. Uh, we've just released a course on AI for pharma, but only really a lot of the lessons, we've got 12 modules, actually apply to any industry. You know, two of them are very, very pharma specific, but the other ones are about, um, you know, what is AI? What is generative AI? What are the legal, ethical and other considerations that you need? What's the process? How, what are the things you need to think about data and all of those kinds of things? So we have released that. For women, um, I'm seeing a lot more women in AI these days. You know, 20 years ago, it was a lot less. There were some very impressive female data scientists already then, but there's a lot more women in AI these days. I have seen that I met um, a woman who started a company for recruitment and, and actually her focus is recruiting black women. And so it was called Black Up Tech in tech. And so she created an algorithm to help find really amazing black women to for these kind of roles. In fact, I did a podcast with her, really, really impressive. So she's using AI to increase diversity and female diversity uh, in the field of AI and tech. So AI is being used for actually helping women too in that way. That's super cool. That's super, super cool. And then can I ask you, when you look at sustainability, um, you know, it's a massive topic we need to address right now. 
because of wildfire and all the you know weather related risk we are seeing every single day um and you know just a few days ago we had this major flash flood in new york i hope you see so some of the visuals impressive and i think you need some time those to realize how bad that is one of my closest friend was in hawaii and uh, experienced wildfire for himself and he was going to a wedding and he was explaining you know you 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 hear about it until you experience it you actually do not really understand our world is being affected by all those changes. So can you tell us how AI can contribute to sustainability in healthcare, but also any other scenarios you've seen as well around you to help our listener understand the power of artificial intelligence, partly when it is used for good, which is, I think, the most important part. How do we use AI for good? Actually, for sustainability, I mean, I haven't really thought about what I'm about to say, but it just occurred to me that you could take that data and create algorithms to look at what is the best way to be sustainable. That would be very a very interesting exercise, wouldn't it? Looking at all of the different data and actually putting AI itself onto the task of making predictions about what's the the most sustainable way to do all of these different things yeah a b and c interesting yeah indeed very interesting so um my last question dr andre bates so if my listener our listeners would like to to find you where should they go well i'm on linkedin as as are you um and our website's ularis e-u-l-a-r-i-s dot com and so what would be your last words of wisdom for everyone out there? I Well, I've got one thing that is a little bit of my rant, a bit of a rant. But um, when I show people all the different applications of AI in my industry, people always say, I want all of that. That's All of that's really important. And... I think the one thing that a lot of people forget is that AI is a tool that we can leverage. And so we need to start with strategy. You know, we need to look strategically. It's a a business tool. It's not AI for the sake of AI. So we really need to be creating some kind of strategic blueprint to make sure that we um, are looking at what the company, where they want to get to, where the pain points and blockers are, and then you can see where you can weave AI in to be effective. And I think that's a really important thing because I see so many companies just wanting to do AI for the sake of AI, or some companies got some great AI tool and a great salesman, and they say, oh, this is really cool. Uh, You have to really link the business objectives with what you're trying to achieve. And it has to start with strategy, and then you go into the AI. I so much agree. First, think about strategy. I would add a great quote from AWS, you know, Jeff Bezos. You have to look at the end and keep the end in mind. So the outcome. And then based on that, you just draw your, your roadmap where you want what needs to happen to achieve that outcome. And then can you define what is the best artificial intelligence capability required to achieve that outcome? Exactly. And you could, there's so many different ways to skin a cat. You know, there's so many different AIs that can solve all those problems. So the next thing you need to do also is once you've come up with all these things that could all be brilliant, is do another little strategic analysis on the AI that you've come up with and say, which one of these is going to give the most impact? Yes. Which one is feasible? We've, we've got the data or we can get the data because that's always the, you know often a problem. Uh, which one has got the best cost, cost benefit? You know, all of those things need to go into this. Absolutely, prioritization next. And then it's about execution. At the end of the day, we can spend so much time thinking about it. And I think it's also about trialing and error. You know, the the nice things with generative AI, it's actually cost effective. You can try things for ten dollars here and there. And so things which works for you, you keep things which do not work, you just throw away. And even when I look at audio, video, um text uh picture you know there are things uh, it's like some platforms i absolutely love others which are more less likely to use because 
I'm a business person trying to leverage AI for my business needs. And some still feel for me very technical. So I think to everybody, yeah, I would say just go and try and then get rid of what you don't need. It's a $50 investment. Just make sure you keep your membership really tight and only focus on what is going to deliver value to you. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining me on Scoutic for Gross. Until next time, I guess. Thank you for having me. If you like this podcast, subscribe now, share with your friends, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a five-star review. Also, if you want to cover any specific subject with me, contact me on Instagram under Sabine VDL Officials or LinkedIn under Sabine Van der Linden. Thank you.